I've been uh, very curious about uh, how science gets embedded in in politics, in the world of, of humans and society and and, uh, and institutions, and I think a really rich uh, area to explore those those relationships is looking at physics, especially physics in the United States uh, during the period of the Cold War, during the period coming out of World War II, and when scientists and historians think about that period, uh, especially in the United States, they tend to tell a story about, about rising exponentials, about huge runaway growth. So one obvious area that was growing was funding, the, the, the money to support research in the sciences, especially in physics and in closely related areas like mathematics and engineering, that the funding uh, was just growing like gangbusters, it had no uh, no analog to what had come before. Budget, even if we adjust for inflation, the budget grew by a factor of 25 times between the, the eve of World War II and the early years after the end of the war, and, and it kept growing after that. So there's enormous um, pouring of money into uh, the basic sciences, especially physics and closely related areas. The source of that funding had also changed. So before the war, the federal government had been a fairly uh, small player in supporting science, and after the war, they became practically the only uh, major patron around, especially in the United States. So it was uh, government money, especially kind of uh, defense-related or military money, on a scale that had no um, comparison before the war. That's the first big change uh, when we think about science uh, in the Cold War, this huge growth in funding. A second one that again became obvious even at, to, to participants at the time was the growth in the scale of the apparatus. It was often called big science. So there had been big machines in the sciences before World War II, but that became the rule, not the exception. So there were atom smashers, particle accelerators that were no longer a bench top, but that would dwarf a person. That would be the size of a factory or a city block. Enormous, enormous uh, machines that were so expensive that required all that money uh, from the federal government. So the second sort of huge change that people often talked about at the time was his growth in the kind of infrastructure, in the machinery of trying to do science, especially in physics uh, and in many other areas. The third one that has really captured my attention that, I've been, that I think is actually most telling and most, most, um, most curious about this time period is the runaway growth in enrollments, in the students who are rushing to the sciences, especially physics and some areas of engineering, after World War II. Again, that's all out of proportion to what had been the pattern before the war. Uh, and it's that third exponential, the curve of students, uh, that I think is really, um, uh, really most informative about the history of, of being a young scientist in that time period. So it turns out the growth in student numbers was common across um, higher education in the United States. Every field in the universities was growing exponentially after the war. Uh, there were more people studying history than ever before, more people studying chemistry and art, uh, but the rates of growth weren't the same, and so in fact, physics grew twice as quickly as any other field. So even as all fields were growing rapidly, more and more young people entering universities for higher education, some fields grew much, much quicker than others, and physics led the pack. Uh, this was not just a question of demographics, of the so-called baby boom. It's not just there were more young college-aged people around. Instead, there was a kind of shift in the priorities and the incentives to try to channel more people to study some areas uh, more than others. So there were huge programs like what was in the United States called the GI Bill. It was a very generous program to fund uh, veterans of World War II to enter higher education, many of whom uh, likely would never have gone to college or, or uh, graduate school uh, before the war. So there was a general increase in the student population. Uh, and then there were added incentives that were sh channeling students towards physics and mathematics and engineering uh, and not to other fields. And so we see an enormous um, disparity where some fields like physics become the kind of um, poster child of much more general growth trends. So it was a question of politics and incentives and, and, and priorities in the early Cold War, not just more young people going into the university system. And that was actually a big change in the United States. In the US, uh, funding for education had almost never come from the federal level. In fact, a, a whole century had passed before the last really big effort from the federal government to get students into universities. That had been, uh, the previous time had been in the middle of the 19th century, right in the early years of the American Civil War 
war, uh, when there was a law passed by Congress that guaranteed that every state in the Union would have uh, one and eventually two universities to have a huge growth in the university system. Uh, and then it was decided education was a local affair. The federal government had no business in interfering in education. It was not a highly centralized process like it was in many other countries at the time. So it was a really big deal coming out of World War II, almost 100 years later, to have this very active effort by the federal government all over again. The second time around, coming after the war in the early years of the Cold War, the reasoning was again framed in terms of a kind of national emergency. This was the period when the, um, the tensions between the U United States and the Soviet Union were hardening. We eventually get into what came, became known as the Cold War. And that drove all kinds of priorities and spending, it, it turns out, in both countries, as we now know. And in the US, it drove a kind of frenzy in, uh, in trying to make many, many more young scientists as quickly as possible. There was a great concern that the Soviet Union was training many more physicists and engineers than the United States. And there were all these reports commissioned, and people tried to track the flow of people in the Soviet academies as best as they could learn about them uh, from outside the Soviet Union. And so a lot of scientists and politicians and journalists in the United States acted uh, with, with great concern that in a kind of nuclear age, in an age in which very advanced weaponry seemed to be based on the most cutting edge results in uh, physics and uh, engineering, that the United States needed to make many, many more of those types of people just to keep pace with, uh, with this new, this new uh, rival of the Soviet Union. So again, this helped um, break a century tradition in which the government played very little role in education, and that just opened floodgates um, of uh, of funding and of funding that was channeled in, in some directions more than others. So we see the number of PhDs in physics, for example, in the United States growing quicker than every other field, doubling every uh, one and a half years after the end of the war. So the number of PhDs per year doubled several times, even before the United States entered the Korean War just a few years later. It's this enormous, enormous uh, rate of growth. And that continued uh, and was ramped up again after the Soviets launched the Sputnik satellites, or the two satellites, in 1957, which again was greeted in the United States as a kind of uh, a reason, an, uh, uh, a need, it was perceived as a need, to get even more people into physics and mathematics and engineering, uh, even though those fields had grown faster th than any other field even up to that date. So it was, a, it was a new round of funding. So the whole point is that all of this was generating, was sort of political decisions or calculations, uh, the idea being that the United States needed a, a kind of scientifically trained Force. It was often described as manpower, which is a word usually used for sort of military armies. Uh, and they would talk about scientific manpower as a defense uh, for the Cold War. Now, almost all those people, most of the people, were not working on weapons projects. They weren't working on classified research. The idea was to get the sort of uh, the, the skill set in place, get lots and lots of people trained, keep them tracked, know where they were, keep them kind of registered at the federal level, so that if the Cold War turned into an overt, a hot war, then they'd be mobilized much more quickly. So the idea was to train them to the best possible degree, have them kind of in the system and, and, and tracked and uh, uh, capable of, of earning draft deferments. They wouldn't go off to fight in the Korean War. They'd stay in their classrooms and train more science students, precisely because they were a resource in case the Cold War turned into an, into an overt or so-called hot war. So that drives all kinds of changes in the field, and that's what I've been curious about. So what happens? when you take a discipline and you expand its numbers of students exponentially quickly. So what had been a rather modest, even a small-sized field in the universities across North America becomes the fastest growing one around. So subjects that had once been uh, classes where you might have a dozen students, maybe 20 students, now routinely have 100 students. Soon they'd have 200 students in these packed auditorium style classrooms, an incredibly rapid change. And so that sets in motion all kinds of changes in the intellectual world and what it means to do physics, not just who goes into physics, not just who has incentives or deferments from the draft or is not going to go into the army, but even in what counts as the ideas of the field. And so what, it, what fascinates me is this interplay between the, the kind of 
politics and institutions and the infrastructure for pursuing science and the type of science that gets done. So there are a couple ways to try to, to, try to get at that. Uh, one of the topics I've been looking at is in the journals. So how do you handle the communication of scientific results if the pool of people and results grows exponentially quickly? So the rate at which the journals began growing was an exact match of the rate at which new PhDs were being made. Each new PhD was making more knowledge, right? At least that was the goal. So you have all those students in the system producing dissertations, writing up published articles based on those dissertations. So the journals were growing at the exact same exponential pace, faster than anything that anyone had ever, had ever been used to before. And that sets them into a tizzy all over again. So there are physical problems with that. How do you actually get enough paper? There were paper shortages right after World War II and raw materials. There were also, it sounds almost funny when we look back, they didn't know how to glue volumes together if the page count exceeded 500 pages. They had to change the physical binding. I mean, this is what they had to worry about because the journals were just ballooning out of control. And so between around 1950 and 1970, the main American journal uh, for physics research called the Physical Review, publishing across all the domains of basic research in science, unclassified basic research uh, in physics, that went from being around 3,000 pages per year to over 30,000 pages per year. So it was doubling about every six years, the annual page count. Um, so that sets up all kinds of stresses and, and people worry about how to keep track of it. No one can read 30,000 pages in a year. Uh, and so one of the things that starts happening is you have a, a speeding up of an otherwise kind of natural process in the sciences of specialization. So if there are more and more young students mastering little parts of the study of nature per year, then you have to start carving up the fields of study more and more finely. And that has been going on for centuries. It's in some sense perhaps an inevitable process for how science changes over time. But the rate of that, of that kind of splitting really took off, again, during the Cold War in the face of this huge increase in the numbers of researchers, of young scientists pursuing their, their uh, graduate work. And so that starts putting pressure on the journals. So should the journals split by subfield or by sub-subfield? Uh, or should they try to have a kind of view of the whole discipline, which is now kind of shaky and no one knows what that means anymore? You see a similar effect on uh, students' general exams. What should every PhD in the field be expected to know? If they're going to go into nuclear physics, and nuclear physics has now been divided into sort of 30 distinct separate specialties, then can we really expect a young PhD student to also know what there is to know about atoms and molecules, or uh, matter in, in the solid state, or electricity magnetism, or optics? And so there's a pressure over specialization at the, at the training level as well. So, and then, and then how do you handle the refereeing for all those papers? So all those papers have to be peer reviewed and the community has grown so rapidly, so quickly that it's not the case that editors just know everyone anymore. You have a kind of, and they talk about it in very personal terms, as if the field had gone from a kind of small village where most people knew everyone, and they could gather at the annual meetings and they'd kind of know each other, to a, to a large, almost like a city. So it goes from a small town feel, at least as the physicist described it at the time, to this massive teeming city where most people seem sort of anonymous. They don't know everyone anymore. And that means it's harder to assess which people are well known for the best quality, which students are coming from the right programs. And so they have to worry about peer review in a kind of mass anonymous community as opposed to uh, the kind of smaller close-knit world they had been familiar with from before World War II. And so we have this period of, of exponential growth which starts acting back on, on the subject of knowledge itself in all these curious ways, sort of uh, unintended ways. There are changes in, uh, in graduate work, changes in uh, staple coursework and so on. And what's fascinating to me is that all that comes to a shrieking halt around 1970 or in the early 1970s when that huge buildup which seems so natural and obvious given the political state of the world Policymakers and scientists and, and uh, politicians change course, the military changes course, starting around 1970, and that whole system comes crashing down. Every field in the university starts deflating, fewer and fewer students going into those fields, and none fell faster than physics. Uh, the early years of detente with the Soviet Union changed military priorities. Uh, the escalation of fighting in the Vietnam War changed uh, the notions of what role the Defense Department should play in higher education. 
economic recession, the whole system fell apart after about 25 years. And so we have this sort of boom and bust cycle. It looks like a stock market crash when you plot things like the numbers of PhDs per year. We have an enormous buildup, a change in what it means to do science, and then a sudden change all over again. And so that's why I think tracing through the sort of infrastructure of training young scientists helps us peel back and get a view of how the sciences themselves have been evolving over the last uh, several decades.